Hi, I'm David Fetter, Executive Editor of Technical for Prepared Foods, and welcome to a Prepared Foods presentation on ingredient trends in new product development. Joining us today is Carolyn Cotto. She's co-founder and COO of Renewal Mill PBC. It's a California company at the forefront of our new circular economy of food upcycling. Um, Renewal Mill converts the byproducts of grain, seed, and legume food and ingredient processing into a retail line of clean label organic specialty flours and baking mixes. And Carolyn grew up in food. She's working for her family's ice cream business in Sandwich, Massachusetts. And she also served as a Fulbright Fellow in Taiwan. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science from Georgetown University in Human Science with focus on nutrition. And her experience, uh, in addition to the ice cream shop, includes being part of the UN World Food Program in Cambodia, work with the White House and participation in Techstars Farm to Fork Accelerator, and then at HubSpot, where she ran the Women's Global Diversity Program. Renewal was the winner of IFT's Food Disruption Challenge for Reducing Waste and Improving Nutrition, and she's going to tell us how to do it. Welcome, Caroline. Thanks so much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Excited to, to chat about upcycling. Great. So now, although upcycling of some sort has always been practiced in the food industry, I, I came out of the restaurant industry and uh, I remember uh, one restaurant owner where I was executive chef slapping me on the back and telling me that what he liked was not only that I kept food costs low, but I did it by using every part of the chicken but the cluck. And uh, you know, so it's been around for a while. However, in the food product development and manufacturing industry, it seems to have like burst onto the trend scene fairly suddenly in the 20 teens. And then it's taken off rapidly and it seems kind of out of nowhere, this, this aspect of it. So um, what is your take? What is it you think lit that fire? I think it's a few things, but mainly I think it's kind of a data revolution, right? So there's this mm -hmm. issue of you can't fix a problem unless you know what's happening. And so in the 2010s, there was kind of the first real data about food loss and waste at scale. And the NRDC came up with this number that globally about 40% of the food that we produce is going to waste. And that was a staggering realization for most people that, you know, we're spending so much effort to grow all of this food. And if we were to use 100% of it, we could feed everyone the world over. But instead, what's happening is we're throwing 40% of it out um, without even being able to, to process that or, you know, it's we're throwing it out at the home level as well. So I think that's really what sparked the initial interest in, okay, this is happening. How can we start solving it? That's, a, that's an astonishing number. I, I did read recently that food waste, on top of being a global crisis, is estimated at three quarters of a trillion dollars annually. Uh, and that's just staggering. Um, and of course, as you pointed out, hunger is rampant in many countries. And we're hearing that worldwide, more food is grown than needed with, uh, you know, as you put, third to half of it going to waste. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of this by time it gets from the field to the trash heaps uh, or rocks in the field. Um, and then, of course, at home. So with a problem that big, this is going to, I don't mean for this to be a gotcha question, but with a problem that big, can upcycling make a significant dent in that problem? Yeah, upcycling is definitely one part of the solution. But when we think about food loss and waste, we're really talking about problems that are happening across the supply chain, right? So there's as you alluded, there's there's produce being left on farms, there's byproducts coming out of manufacturing facilities, which is what Renewal Mill namely deals with. Um, and then there's, you know, the food happening at restaurants that's being thrown away after service. And then there's the, the food waste happening in our own homes. And all of those require different interventions. Um, upcycling is, is one solution there. And for the most part, it's kind of focused upstream, because if we can prevent more of that food waste from happening upstream, then we're, you know, not having it like consumers have to deal with it in their own homes. 
Um, and so for upcycling, I think it can make a really big difference. Um, for instance, our first partner is a, a soy company that produces tofu. They throw out about 60% of the soybean mass that they bring into their facility in order to make wow. the tofu. With upcycling, we're able to turn 100% of that soybean into tofu and soy milk, which is what they produce, and then the flour, which is what we produce from the byproduct. And that is that that flour made from the pulp left over from making soy milk, which is called okara, is full of fiber and full of protein. And we're bringing that back to people's plates. Um, wow, that's awesome. They're, they're doing similar work. Yeah, and, and, and you know, using soy was an excellent example because it's one of the largest crops in the world. So if we can, you know, cut the waste of that by more than half, if you're using that 60% that would normally go into landfills and you're using that that that's just awesome um let, let's uh get a little personal you started renewal in 2016 and at that time upcycling was only barely on the mainstream map so what inspired you how did you start without a lot of precedent out there to go on i mean you pretty much started from scratch yeah, so my background, um, as we kind of went over, has been mostly in nutrition, but I have a co-founder named Claire who started Boston's first organic juice company, oh. and she was taking a lot of care to source locally organic grown produce um, from farms in the Boston area, and at the end of every day after juicing, she was left with a giant mountain of fruit and vegetable pulp that she couldn't use. So she tried using it in things like muffins and crackers and cookies, but there was just way too much of it. Um, and then she had the opportunity to meet the owner of this large tofu company, and they immediately bonded over their pulp waste problem. And he said to her, basically, you think you make a lot of pulp in your tiny, you know, one-off juicing business. I'm making tons and tons uh, on the order of 50 tons of pulp a week um, that is otherwise going to waste. And so that was really where the idea got started. What if there was a way to create more circularity in this system? And, and as we were just discussing, return this nutrition that's harvested in a fully food safe manner back to the human food supply chain. And this isn't happening just with, you know, the pulp left over from making soy milk. It's happening from the pulp left over from different processes like oat milk making, almond milk making, you know, corn processing, uh, green bananas that otherwise are not up to spec to make it to the grocery store, uh, pineapple cores. So the opportunities are really endless in terms of when you start looking at what's being thrown out, how creative can you be in bringing that back to the table? It's true. It's it's all usable. I, you were talking about bananas, and I know green banana flour has been um, making its way toward the mainstream. And uh, I, I was reading an article a few days ago about banana peel. A lot of people just don't know banana peels are edible. And I know in Brazil, they make a snack out of banana peels. I learned that uh, about a decade and a half ago. But, you know, you, you're right. These are, there is an endless source for these types of products. Um, so uh, let me throw a two-parter uh, question at you. What were the major hurdles when you started out back then? I mean, you, as you guys said, you started out with a little bit of pulp. All of a sudden, you've got access to all this soy pulp. Um, so what were your major hurdles starting out? And then when you tell me that, what are your major hurdles now? Yeah, it's a great question. I think when we started out, we had two main hurdles. <laughs> the first was that we were kind of pioneering this process. And so byproducts are tricky to work with. So we were working with this wet pulp. It comes off of the, the processing line. It's about 80% water. So it's extremely heavy to transport and it starts spoiling within four hours. So it Ooh. needs to be dealt with really quickly. Otherwise you have a stinky, steaming wet mess on your hands. Um, and so some of our challenges were kind of figuring out how do we operationalize this um, and we decided to, to use a co-location model. So actually bringing equipment to the manufacturing sites so that we didn't have to transport this wet material at all. And we would only be transporting it once it was processed into a, its final dry flower form. Um, the other main issue I would say was 
um, just the concept of marketing food waste, right? Like consumers were really skeptical, like, oh, it's gross. Like, I don't want to eat anything that's associated with waste. You know, why would I put this on my package to, to tell people that that's where this came from? Isn't this unsafe? And we really had to do a ton of work to change that narrative to say, this is not food waste. It's wasted food. It's perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. It's full of flavor and nutrition. It should be celebrated as a hero ingredient. And can't we all agree that food waste is a really silly problem um, and that there's so much impact that when we reduce food waste, we're actually helping fight climate change because food waste is a major emitter of greenhouse gases. So oh. over the last five years, we really had a lot to do in getting consumers on board. And I'm happy to report that right now we're seeing a lot of positive momentum of people excited about this concept of upcycled food as a consumer driven solution to food waste. That, that's excellent. That's the, the classic sell the sizzle, not the steak. It's not waste, it's wasted food. Uh, that that's that's a great way to do it. Um, and I think effective. I think you're right. I think that's what's kind of turned the tide and made this a mainstream issue that consumers are buying into like that. Um, so the, the major hurdles now, I would yeah. say, we have, um, you know, we've done a really good job of starting to educate the industry. So most people that work in the food industry have heard of the term upcycled. I think we still have a ways to go with the average consumer that are, you know, they they maybe have heard of it in the term upcycled as it refers to clothing or furniture, but they're still getting acquainted with how it relates to food. And then not only once they learn about the term upcycled, are they actually willing to pay more for upcycled products? Um, I think the jury's still out a bit on that. So um, some of our hurdles continue to be around marketing and and how do we get buy-in from consumers at the retail level as well as from um, consumers at, at the B2B level where we're selling ingredients. And our main value proposition to them is to say, if you use upcycled ingredients, we can help you achieve your net zero goals for, for carbon targets um, because these ingredients are so much more climate friendly. Um, and so we can show them when you use it in a cereal or a chip or a you know cookie, you're having a much lower carbon footprint and saving this much water. Um, gotcha. Um, so what do you think the major challenges that makers of finished foods and beverages are going to face, you know, on, on their end of this upcycled foods arena? Um, you know, you and, and I know the majority of your business is, you know, making baking mixes and, and, you know, selling for retail, you know, retail items, uh, uh you know, on your website, um, so, you know, here you are, you're kind of straddling both worlds, but, um, you know, let, let, let's take it to the next level. And you've got the um, person who wants to make, um, you know, whole cakes, ready to go, frozen cakes, whatever, uh, and, and use these ingredients. What are the challenges that they're going to face? And, and, let me ask that as a as a technical question because we've already covered the fact that there might be some consumer education over the concept, but let's jump to the actual. Hey, I'm going to be using uh, upcycled okara flour to make a finished cake product to freeze that people can thaw and eat. What what's what are they looking at when they want to go do this? Yeah, you definitely have to find R&D people that are excited by the challenge. In most cases, and not all, but most cases, upcycled ingredients are not going to be a one-to-one -one swap for something that product developers are already using. So in the case of Okara flour, it has all of these benefits, right? It, it's like 60% fiber, it's 20% complete protein, um, it's naturally gluten-free, um, it's naturally grain-free but it's not a one-to-one -one replacement for wheat flour. So you really have to get somebody who's excited about, okay, I have to use like 20% Okara flour, you know, 20% brown rice. I need to create this blend that will have the added benefits that this ingredient is offering, but might be a little bit more challenging to lock in the formulation up front. Um, with other things like especially produce-based upcycled ingredients, they can be a little bit more seamless. For example, Matriarch Foods is a company that makes tomato sauce. So if you're making something with tomato sauce, it's pretty seamless to use their, their upcycled tomato sauce. But um, I think 
for for you know you have to be willing to flex with the ingredients because upcycled suppliers are dependent on that and there can be some variability in terms of product spec that might be a little bit more different than a traditional virgin ingredient i was just about to ask that um as as far as the uh upcycled okara flour in fairness, that's no different from any other high protein, high fiber flour, uh, you know, especially a gluten free one. So, uh, you know, there are already, you know, R&D people who are experts at using these high protein, high fiber flours and uh, in, incorporating them in the right balance into uh, a, a product. But I was going to ask about consistency. Um, and yes, with you know produce, I can see where you could it, there there's a a wide variety uh, of texture, flavor, color differences in produce in general. So you know, um, but for something like a a flour or a starch, is there a lot of variation in consistency? No, there's it's it's actually quite consistent, um, which is why Renewal Mill has started with those byproduct streams. So if we look at the Okara coming out of you know three or four soy milk and tofu facilities, it's pretty uniform across all of those different manufacturing processes. Um, and so we're able to offer that to our customers in terms of you can you can expect similarity across the spec for the most part. Um, we get the question a lot about consistency in supply, like will you have enough material available? Um, and that's also why we've chosen to go after specifically like the byproducts of tofu making and the byproducts of oat milk production as our two largest sources, because both of those are categories that are growing. So uh, sales of tofu and sales of oat milk are continuing to skyrocket. And as they skyrocket, so too does the amount of byproduct. And so then we're able to offer more consistent supply to our customers that are using those side streams. Mm, okay, that's and and you know that does uh, answer you know my question on consistency. And I was going to jump into the supply issue, the consistency of supply. And you know, thank you for answering that one. Um, and it and you know it brings up another point uh, just for renewal itself for you guys. What's next on your agenda that you're allowed to disclose? Um, because you know there is certainly more than soy and oat going on in you know just that one channel of milk alternatives uh the milk analogs uh it's being made from everything now so i can imagine that there's just going to be you know almonds uh, can, can you take the uh upcycled ingredients from almond milk making and turn them into marzipan i don't know but you know, i'm wondering <laughs> if that's the kind of thing that can be done yeah i mean that's the really exciting part of this industry is that they're just are so many opportunities you know people come to us on a weekly basis and say like i have you know a million pounds of peanut butter and jelly crusts is there something you can do with this or you know i have a million pounds of liquid or ice cream base um unfortunately we're not able to to help with all of those different streams quite yet but we have expanded this year to bring on three additional ingredients. Um, so we have our white corn flour, which is a byproduct of the corn meal milling process. We have our pineapple fiber, which is coming from those pineapple cores that would have otherwise been discarded. And we have that green banana flour that's coming oh, from the right. whole green bananas <laughs> with the peel on. So those are kind of the 2023 expansion. For 2024, we're going to be doubling down on just trying to kind of increase velocity and in getting more people to use those ingredients before we expand into new ones. And then on the retail side, um, continuing to anchor ourselves in the baking space. So we sell both flowers and baking mixes for retail customers, um, but starting to move more into ready to eat sweet snacking as well, um, just because we want to offer that convenience that people are really looking for is sort of, you could choose a traditional chocolate chip cookie, or you could choose one made with upcycled ingredients and, and feel slightly better about that choice. Oh, I think, I think that is just absolutely excellent. Um, uh, what about pasta? It seems like there could be a lot of promise for pasta in a lot of what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. We've definitely done trials with pasta with both the Okara flour and the, the green banana. So um, as far as 
helping our customers be successful with these ingredients. I think we're we're more interested in pasta in that regard than under the Renewal Mill brand. But mm -hmm. if there's any pasta makers out there that are interested in getting into the upcycled game, we'd definitely love to talk to them. Oh, okay. Well, you know, hopefully some will be watching this and listening to this and saying, hey, you know, this is a good idea. Um, I, I do know, I've, I've talked to some folks in the pasta business about oat flour, and they've said it's extremely, you know, tricky to use for, for a pasta, but, you know, we've certainly seen uh, legume-based pastas, and, you know, there, there's a lot of promise there. Um, I haven't seen banana flour, green banana flour used in a pasta yet, but that could be interesting. Um what a world you're opening up. I, I think there's a, an incredible promise here. And, you know, we opened up, we were talking about making a dent in this uh, three quarter trillion dollar waste stream. And, you know, the, the food industry, both um, finished products, food service, it's a $2 trillion industry. So I, I think that uh we've got a good future ahead of us for, you know, making this happen. Um, listen, I want to thank you very much for your in-depth look that you've provided for not only your company, but for the uh, upcycling industry. Um, it's a rapidly expanding trend. Um, really impressed. I'd like to have you back again a little bit, uh, you know, maybe in a few months, catch up with, you know, what's going on. And I want to thank our audience for uh, joining us here. Uh, we invite all of you out there to check out uh, the many articles on upcycling and other topics at preparedfoods.com. Uh, we've upcycled a wealth of articles, videos, podcasts, white papers, webinars, infographics, all by top experts in the industry, uh, such as Ms. Cotto, and uh, all that's there to help food and beverage uh, developers and manufacturers succeed. Um, thank you again, Ms. Cotto, for Renewal Mills. I'm David Fetter, Executive Editor Technical for Prepared Foods Media. And uh, thank everyone for joining us. See you all next time. 